Good morning and welcome to Our Savior's Baptist Church. We are so glad to have you here joining us today as in person as well as those online. And, and so we're going to begin our worship service this morning by standing and singing. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand, just the sheep of his hand. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Just the sheep of his hand. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> um, no, I am not Pastor Neil. Uh, hopefully most everybody has heard uh, by now that uh, Karis came down a little bit ill uh, over before her party yesterday, so they had to cancel the party and that. And so Pastor uh, wanted to take precautions as, as uh, uh recorded his message and we'll be showing that here shortly and so uh, be praying for them that uh, the test results will all be uh, just fine but uh, pray for them as well as they're uh, uh, having to stay pulling themselves away so that they're not an issue for us here at church and so um, I'm going to be taking care of some of these extra parts <coughs> excuse me um Announcements wise, Wednesday night we are continuing with our Zoom Bible study. Uh, Pastor has been able to set that up and we've had uh, folks joining us on Zoom as well as those that are able to join us on uh, Wednesday nights here at the church. And so if you want to be a part of that, you can touch base with uh, Pastor and he'll get, he'll get you lined up with that. And I think Patty puts that on the, uh, the uh, announcements that she sends out email wise as well for for hooking up to that, but that's 6.30, 6.30, excuse me, on Wednesday nights, and so it'd be great to have you join us. That's a great time. And then next Sunday, we'll be having a congregational meeting. Uh, that'll be 11.30 following the second service uh, next Sunday, and we will have Zoom meeting uh, as an option as well for anybody that uh, uh, wants to, needs to be to uh, stay away to join us uh, and we'll have uh, opportunities for input uh, from folks through the through zoom as well and so we'll be uh, talking about it just be uh, an informational meeting as far as things that are going on as we're trying to deal with uh, the uh, pandemic and all of that and, and the different things that we're trying to do here at church uh, I know that uh, Eric and Joanna will have a, a treasurer's report, so you'll have an idea of where we're at uh, financially. And then we'll, we'll be wanting to discuss the possibilities of uh, uh, taking on a worship leader uh, as a uh, part of the, the worship team and uh, uh, what that may entail and what we'd be liking to look for. And so we'll be having discussions on that as well. And so uh, uh, with that, that'll be following next Sunday's second service. And with that, then our featured missionaries are Rick and Ferry Hatton. And I was visiting with Dory just a few minutes ago. Um, they've had some health issues here over the last year plus. And uh, uh, 
things have been going a fairly a little bit better, I think. But Rick is, has been battling uh, bad, tough times with his back. And, and so, I mean, we're all hitting that stage where uh, <laughs> the health issues become a concern. And so uh, we want to lift them up. But she also said that they're, they're in the finances uh, is also a real concern as well um, through Awana and everything else. This has really been a tough uh, stage of going through and, and just tough times anyway. And so we want to lift them up and then as well as others that... Uh, um, may have some health needs. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and we'll uh, bring it to, to his attention. Heavenly Father, we truly do thank you for uh, being here and being with us. We think of the clusters, we think that uh, we think of the needs that they have, of the concerns that they have. We pray that your spirit would uh, be with them and giving them the comfort, be with Karis as she deals with this. Uh, uh, illness, and Lord, that you would uh, just uh, protect them all and keep them safe, just as we pray for the church family. Father, we think of uh, all those that have had health issues here over the last uh, few months, as well as lingering longer. Lord, we pray that you would be with them, that you would give them the healing that uh, is needed, the comfort of your hand. And Lord, we ask that uh, in all these things, uh, that you would help and direct and, and show us how you are in control. Uh, Father, we think of this with the virus and all that. Lord, uh, we know that uh, it's part of your plan, and, and a lot of times we don't understand the whole ramifications of that. But, Father, we ask that you would uh, continue to guide us and direct us in all that we would, would and should be doing. Lord, I... Uh, I want to lift up the Hattons this morning. I pray that you would be with Rick and Ferry as they have dealt with some uh, health issues here in the past. Uh, uh, Lord, that you would help them as they uh, continue their ministry of leading uh, the Awana programs. Father, you, it is your uh, program, and we know that all things happen because of what you want done. And, and Lord, we lift them up to you. We uh, Think of the finances that they're uh, dealing with, and we pray that you would be with them as well, that you would help them as they uh, deal with these, uh, the things that come up with that, and just help them to uh, uh, continue to walk and to be faithful to you. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we will continue our worship service then by standing, and let's read our verse from Romans this morning. Therefore, Therefore, since we have, have been justified through faith, through faith we, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Romans 5, 1. And then, amazing grace, my chains are gone. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. promise good to me is worth my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my 
my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine. You are And then old blood. <laughs> oh, the blood, crimson love, price of life's demands, shameful sin. Placed on him the hope of every man. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Savior, Son, Holy One, slain so I can live. Oh, see the Lamb, the great I Am, who takes away my sin. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Oh, what love, no greater love. Grace, how can it be? That in my sin, yes, even then, he shed his blood for me. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. What a sacrifice that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. And then speak, O Lord. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the fruit of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance 
of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let their truth prevail over plans for us. Truth unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And my grace will stand on your promises, and my faith will walk as you walk with us. Speak O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, Pastor will deliver his message. Good morning. I hope you're all doing well this morning. And uh, as you can tell already that uh, I wasn't here for the announcements and uh, wasn't here for worship because, uh, well, um, it's actually Friday night when I'm recording this because I just found out this morning my daughter woke up with a fever and some, you know, a stuffy congestion. And, a, and uh, so we thought it best that we um, self-quarantine for a couple days to make sure she's okay. Uh, we are uh, having her tested uh, on, actually be Sunday afternoon when she goes in for a test to, to ensure that she does not have COVID, and we're praying that, and we're hoping that it's not that. Uh, I, I honestly believe it's probably not that. Um, but just in an abundance of caution, as they say, uh, we've decided to stay home as a family, and uh, so I'm alone here in the sanctuary recording the message tonight uh, for you on Sunday morning. So we're glad you're here. Thanks for making it a priority to join us. In 1923, George Mallory was asked about his ambition to climb Mount Everest. Mallory was preparing, on his, preparing for his third attempt to climb Mount Everest. His first attempt had ended in failure. His second attempt in 1921 ended in tragedy when seven porters were killed in an avalanche. Yet when asked why he wanted to climb Mount Everest, as he's preparing for his third trip up, Mallory responds with, those words that have become famous today, because it's there. Why do you climb a mountain? Well, be, because it's there. For those of you who run half marathons, why do you run half marathons or full marathons or 5Ks? Well, because it was there. Now, I've run a few uh, half marathons. It's been a number of years ago, but honestly, I ran it for the t-shirt. You know, what is it about our human nature that makes us long to overcome? What is it about our nature that makes us strive for more? There's this persistent sense of dissatisfaction that says, this isn't enough, whatever this is, you know, this job, this, this life, this world we live in, it's just, it's just not enough. There must be something more. It's this innate desire to prove oneself, to demonstrate to others that I'm worthy. And so we strive, we strive to prove ourselves. I recently read an article asking the question, why do people climb? Why do people climb mountains? Specifically, in an article de uh, dedicated to rock climbers, why do they climb? And uh, do they climb to achieve, to, to strive for more? There's, what, what is it that leads them to do that? And rock climbing, as you know, has taken off in popularity. I don't know if you knew, this summer in Tokyo and the Olymp Olympics that now have been postponed, of course, Rock climbing was going to be an Olympic competition. It was making its debut. And the community of rock climbers out there draws daredevils and adrenaline junkies, striving to overcome obstacles. In this article, endurance athlete and dedicated climber Sophie Radcliffe reflects on the power of climbing. She describes it with these words. She says, it's walking this tightrope between risk and security. The endurance and problem solving for mind and body that keep me coming back for more. And then a little further in the article, she goes on to say, 
even when you're putting yourself through hell, questioning your choices, and on the verge of giving up, there's an unspoken reason to keep going. You know how many of us find ourselves in those situations when it's hard, but then there's this striving for something more to keep on going. Another climber, Kathy Carlo, describes climbing this way. She says, one of the greatest things in life is accomplishing what others say you cannot. And each of us is this compelling desire to prove ourselves, to say, I have overcome, to say, I did it. And from the time we're taught to toddlers and we grow up saying, me do it, right? Remember that, how, how desperate your own kids were and, and said, no, 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 me do it. I'll put on my boots, I'll put on my coat or, or whatever it is, me do it. Because we want to say, I did it. We're constantly trying to prove ourselves. But if we're honest, we're not simply striving to prove ourselves to ourselves for the sense of accomplishment, but we're often trying to prove ourselves to others for the sake of acceptance. We're striving to have others accept us. We're striving to find significance in the approval of others. We're striving for that sense that we matter. This morning, we're starting a new series. That new series is called Striving. It's a study through the book of Galatians. As we begin, let me ask you this question. What are you striving for? Is it acceptance? Are you striving to be accepted? Or perfection? Maybe you're striving for perfection. If you could just master a skill, perfect it. Perhaps you're striving for success. Or maybe it's legacy, that, that people would remember you when you're gone, or purpose. How many of you, when you answered that question in your head, what am I striving for, answered with this justification? How many of us are striving for justification? I'm guessing most of you probably didn't say justification. It's kind of a specific term, often one that's unique to church, one that we often use in these circles here. But it's not limited to that, of course. It's more of a legal term. It comes from the legal realm, and it essentially means to regard someone or some action as fair, just, and right. It's, it, it's just. It's the opposite of declaring someone guilty. This person is guilty. This person is justified. And so when we come to the book of Galatians, it's a book that wrestles with this idea of justification. And as I thought about this, it dawns on me that justification really is an issue of acceptance. That is, on what grounds can we be accepted by God? The overarching message of Galatians is that we are justified by faith alone. But throughout the book, we see man's failed attempts as he strives to be justified, strives to gain the approval of others, strives, strives to prove himself righteous, right, in his own efforts. Even before God, we have this tendency to try to prove ourselves, to try to prove that we're worthy, that we're capable, that we in and of ourselves are righteous. When I talk to others about Jesus, and I'm sure you've had this experience too, I'll often ask this question, I'll ask people when I'm telling them about Jesus, if God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you tell him? If God were to come into this room right now, into the living room if you're watching at home, if he were to appear before you and say, why should I let you into heaven? What would you tell him? Often I hear responses like this. Well, I've tried to live a pretty good life. You know, I try to be a good person to treat other people with respect. I've never stolen anything. Sometimes we'll say something like, well, I'm better than most. You know, things like that. If God were to stand before you today and say, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? See, the responses are usually framed in the context of striving. I'm trying. I'm working at it. I'm striving to be what I think God wants me to be. And hopefully, if I strive hard enough, God will accept me. See, here we are with acceptance again. As we start our series today, we, we will be looking at Galatians chapter 1 and verses 1 through 10. 
If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, uh, turn with me into to, uh, Galatians chapter 1. So Galatians chapter 1. Beginning at verse 1. In verses 1 through 5, we see somewhat of a standard greeting. Now, it's not a standard greeting as you and I would think of if we were sending a letter or even an email or a text. This isn't how we typically start it. But in the first century, this was a common greeting. It would start with not, not the recipient, but the sender. And so Paul says, Paul, an apostle, sent, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me. Unlike our typical introduction, he begins saying who he is, establishing his name. So my guess is they knew who he was. He had established the churches in the region, so they knew who he was, but it was a reminder of who he was. And in these words, Paul begins, he, he begins to tell us what his credentials are. Paul, an apostle. In these first few verses, Paul addresses some of the underlying issues that he will address in the remainder of the book. And one of those issues is his apostleship. What qualifies him to stand before men, to, to record a book in the Bible that we should listen to? An apostle, in a very technical sense, is one who is sent out, sent out by an official uh, commission. An apostle is... is it's not necessarily in the context of the church. It could be a governing authority who, who sends someone out in his name. But Paul, speaking here, saying that he has been sent out. It literally means the sent out one. And so Paul talks about this, and then he addresses who it is that commissioned him to go. Because an apostle's not just sent, but he's commissioned. He's commissioned with a message. If it was a government official, he would be commissioned with the message of the governing authority. And so Paul begins to address who commissioned him to be, to be sent. And so what does he say? Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor by men. In other words, his credentials are not earthly credentials. Rather, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So in the, uh, the idea here is that I think it's captured very well, well in the uh, NET Bible. The NET Bible puts it this way. It says, Paul's commission did not come from men or through human agency. And, and I think what that captures there, it, no man sent him. Paul wasn't sent by some guy on the street says, now you go. He was sent by Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God the Father, the same God and Father who raised Jesus from the dead. And, and then you add to it this idea of, or human agency, and human agency means by the will of another person. So even Paul would have his own human agency say, you know, it was my idea that I should go. And in this idea of human agency, it, it was no man's idea that Paul should go. It was not Paul's own idea or any other man's idea that Paul should go, but rather it was God's idea and his commission for him. It was God's agency working through Paul, sending him to the places that God had called him to. Now, to be clear, there's this general sense again that this apostle means a sent out ones. And it can refer to those sent out by another. But Paul in the New Testament is speaking specifically of the apostles that he's now including himself with. Not just one who was sent out, but now he is equating his rank with those who were alive during the time of Christ. Those who were his disciples. Later in Acts, we hear them described as the apostles, the sent out ones. In Acts chapter 1, it gives us some requirements of what it meant to be a disciple. Those expectations, if you were an apostle, in the technical sense, as seen in the book of Acts, first of all, it required that they, that they lived during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. It required that they had a first-hand experience of Jesus himself and that they had witnessed the resurrection. Paul, of course, was not acquainted on a first-hand basis with the other apostles. He had heard about them. Later he would come and he would spend some time with them. But in the time frame from the baptism, as it says in Acts chapter 1, it says when they're appointing an apostle to replace Judas, he said, we need to find someone who was with us from the birth to the resurrection. 
Well, Paul did not satisfy that requirement. But rather, Paul says this. He says, this is not a commission that has been given by man or by human agency, but it's a commission that has been given to me by God. And so Paul, not acquainted with the apostles in the earthly life, not having lived in the same realm as Jesus, but persecuting the church upon the death of Christ, is now called by God when he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus. So he does have a personal encounter with the resurrected Christ. And that, for Paul, satisfies his requirement to be apostle. And in addition to the confirmation of that, that this calling comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and God himself. So, having seen the risen Lord when he encountered him on the road to Damascus, having received by direct revelation the call to apostleship, and having lived such a life that there was visible, concrete evidence of his call to apostleship, the fruit of his labors as he bore witness to the resurrection of Jesus, affirms the apostleship of Christ. This argument will be developed a little bit further because this is a constant thing that these antagonizers of, antagonizers of Galatians are throwing these accusations against Paul and trying to undermine his authority. So we'll come to that again in another message. But ultimately, what Paul is arguing is that his apostleship is of divine, not human origin. Having completed his greetings, he then goes on and he identifies the recipients. It's really quite simple. To the churches in Galatia. Now, he's not talking about a single church. You notice it says churches. It's plural. And he's not talking about a city of Galatia, but rather he's speaking of a region because there were a number of churches, a number of churches in the region of Galatia. It was a letter that would be circulated from one church to another church and to another. Specifically, these cities would be Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. So Paul is sending this letter to churches who have similar issues, who are in a similar region, who have been tempted by similar temptations. Going on in verse 3, Paul then says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. As before, the introduction once again touches on some of the major themes that are yet to come. Some of the themes that will be part of the whole letter. You see, before Paul was laying the foundation of his, uh, before, in the previous verse, we talked about how Paul was laying the foundation of his apostleship. And here, Paul is laying the groundwork for justification by faith. He extends what is a common blessing, this word grace, but he, he changes it a little bit. He says, grace and peace to you, the origin of which comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he extends grace, he extends peace, but grace and peace from Jesus Christ. And he explains that it's through Christ's sacrifice that these things come. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. So in other words, what he's saying is grace and peace to you, not, but, but not just because I say so. Grace and peace to you because Jesus Christ died on the cross. Because Jesus came into this world to rescue us from this present evil age. And that is accomplished for us through the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Which we receive by faith. We receive Christ's payment for our sins by faith. Because of our sins we were in bondage. We were in bondage to this present evil age. Even today, if you look around us, there is evidence, clear evidence, that we live in an evil age. This is nothing new. This is something that has existed since the fall in the garden, living in this evil age. And Paul addresses it here to those in Galatia, saying, you were slaves, you were in bondage in this evil age, but I have come to rescue you. Instead of being slaves to sin, we find grace and we find peace. It's in Christ that we find freedom. And this brings us to the end of the salutation of, Galatia, of Galatians. Something to note here is that it's common in these Greek letters in this first century context 
to, to, to include words of encouragement. So they would come, they would say grace and peace to you. Then they would say thank you for your great bunch of people and all this and that. For example, Romans chapter 1 verse 7 says, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. A little bit later in uh, Corinthians, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 2 it says, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Then in verse 4 he says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. So there's this common thread of greeting and thanksgiving. Thank God for you because of his grace in Christ Jesus. Another example in 1 Thessalonians. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember you before God and our Father who work, whose, uh, your work produced by faith. So the point is this, that typically there's a greeting, there's a identification of the one who is sending. There's an identification of that person who is receiving, an extension of grace, and then some thanksgiving, but Paul doesn't go there to the Galatians. Instead, he goes straight to admonishment. He, he doesn't say, I thank you, Galatians, for who you are and what God is doing for you. Instead, what happens is he jumps into admonishing this church. He says to the churches in Galatians, but then he begins to get angry with them. These platitudes that they expected didn't come. Instead, beginning in verse 6, it says, I'm astonished. I'm blown away. I can't believe that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you. The one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and, and are turning to a different gospel. In other words, he's coming in. He doesn't say, thank God for you. He says, I can't believe what you have done. You have turned your back on the gospel. They're turncoats. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, this idea of turncoat. It's another term for uh, deserters. They have deserted the gospel. A turncoat was someone, apparently they had pens, and uh, they would put them on their, or badges, and they would put them on their jackets or on their coats, and that would identify their allegiance. But what would happen is traitors would take their coats and they would turn them inside out so those pins couldn't be seen and their allegiances couldn't be discovered. You know, these Galatians had hidden their allegiance. At one point they had talked to Paul and Paul had introduced them to Jesus and now they were hiding their allegiance. They were deserting the gospel. These Galatians had believed the claims that, Paul, that Jesus was who Paul had said he was but now they had questions. And so rather than to stand boldly before others and say, I believe in Jesus, that he died on the cross, that he paid the penalty for my sins, he said, I'm going to hide that. Nobody needs to know that. Nobody needs to see that. I'm just going to hide that for a bit. While they claimed allegiance, they hid it. And Paul really comes to the place, he says, this is really no gospel at all that they've deceived you with. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are, are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. You see, you've been deceived with a gospel, which is no gospel at all. It's not a capital G gospel. It's a small g gospel. It has no good news in it. That's what gospel means. This isn't good news. This thing that they have betrayed you with, that they have lied to you about, that they have deceived you, there is no good news in that. It's a false gospel. This gospel was a Christ and gospel. It wasn't that they denied Christ, but what they said was, well, Jesus Christ isn't sufficient. Salvation isn't simply accomplished by faith, but it's accomplished by faith in Jesus and something else. It's Christ and circumcision. It's Christ and keeping the spiritual holidays, the religious holidays. It's Christ and kosher food. It was Christ and the religious festivals. It was Christ and. You know, that's the idea of our striving, isn't it? You know, I've talked to people as I've shared my faith, and, 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 and grace to them is just too easy. There needs to be an and for so many of us, thinking that if I just do this and, if I just receive Christ and, then God will be pleased, but he won't be pleased until I've done the and. 
We face this obstacle, this mountain before us that keeps us from being restored in our relationship to God. And it's because we have this giant and before us. The overarching theme of the Bible, when you think about it, at the heart of every Bible story is this question. A question that I found by the authors of Young and Gilbert. It's a great question. How can hopelessly rebellious, sinful people live in the presence of a perfectly just and righteous God? That is the story of the Bible. That is what the Bible tries to answer. It begins in the Garden of Eden prior to the fall when man was innocent and they stood before God without sin, without blame, without shame. And they were in communion with God. But then Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of which God had commanded them not to eat. And in that moment, shame entered the world. Sin entered the the world. Guilt entered the world. They were once just and righteous, but now they were guilty. When they ate that tree, ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they began to strive. In fact, it talks about the relationships between Adam and Eve, how that was broken, and that their life would be marked by the striving to get that relationship right. And how many of us in our relationships with the world around us strive to get it right and fall so short from time to time? And it was striving as they tilled the soil because the curse on the earth was that it would bring forth weeds. And because of that, man's work would be toilsome. And so we strive to overcome the earth and to create produce. And then the laws given by the Israelites were given so that God's chosen people could live in his presence. When they had been freed from bondage to slavery in Egypt, they took the Israelites out and then they had to figure out, God is living in this tabernacle. How do we, a hopelessly rebellious and sinful people, live in the presence of a perfectly just and righteous God? And so God set up some rules. And he said, in that you will have to sacrifice animals. Goats and bulls, sheep, lambs will have to be sacrificed. Yet then we get to the New Testament. It says, the shedding of, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But the, the shedding of the blood of the boats and bulls and goats would not satisfy. So Jesus comes into the world to pay the penalty for our sins. The death that we deserved, the things that we had done, the sins that we had committed all fell on him, upon Jesus. The job was finished on the cross. How do we live in the presence of a perfectly just and righteous God is when we stand in the righteousness of Christ, having his blood shed on our behalf. But then these agitators come along. These people in Galatia who begin to say, no, that's not enough. It wasn't enough that Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't enough that Jesus, while hanging there, said, it is finished, the debt is paid in full. The debt certainly wasn't paid in full. You still need to be circumcised. They would say, it's, it wasn't paid in full. You still need to participate in religious holidays and eat kosher food and behave like us. And when you behave like us, then you can belong with us. Unless we think that they were anything different than we are often today. How often it is that we say that if you just behave like us, then you can belong with us. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says the debt is paid in full. It was never this thing of trust in Jesus and get your life right. I'm not saying you shouldn't get your life right, but getting your life right is not a requirement to be accepted by God. The only thing required to be accepted by God is that you have received by faith salvation through Jesus Christ, accepting his payment on your behalf for your sins. But these agitators say, no, no, that's not enough. And agitators today say, no, no, that's not enough. They say, believe in Jesus and get involved in social justice. They say, believe in Jesus and feed the poor. Believe in Jesus and don't dance. You know, whatever it is, anytime we add an and to the gospel, we are guilty of being agitators. What they're saying is that if you want to belong with them, you have to behave like them. 
and how often we say that. If you want to belong with us, you have to behave like this. But our behavior is never what is required of us to belong with Jesus. Now, there is this thing in the Bible called sanctification that says from day after day that we become a little bit more like Jesus. That day after day that Christ is sanctifying us through and through to make us, to, to, to bring us to the image of Christ that on the day of salvation we will stand before God in the image of Christ. He will look at us and we will be in his image because we have overcome. But that is a response, not a requirement. It is a response to salvation, not a requirement. We come to Jesus by faith, not by works. We are justified before God, not by what we do, but what, by what Christ has already done. To be justified through Christ means God looks at me. And I, I don't know if you, it used to be an old song. I can't even tell you who sang it, but it was, he looks at me. Justified means he looks at me just as if I'd never sinned. To be justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Because when we receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, we clothe ourselves, the Bible, clothe ourselves, the Bible says, with Jesus Christ. So when God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness, not, his own, not our own. He says, sees us just as if we'd never sinned. We have been forgiven through justification that is received by faith, trusting that Christ died on the cross and that our debt was paid in full. So these agitators come along and they confuse and they pervert the true gospel with a counterfeit. Going on in verses 8 and 9, Paul says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. You think he's serious about this? In other words, he's saying, may they go to hell. And he doesn't say it once, but he says it twice. One might think that the endorsement of an angel might carry some weight. I mean, after all, these people would come and say, well, the angel told me this. But what does Paul say? Even if an angel comes to you, if an angel is coming to you and claiming to tell you a truth that is counter to the truth of God's revealed word, there's a problem. On September 21st of 1823, or so many have been led to believe, the angel Moroni visited a man named Joseph Smith. Perhaps you've heard of him. The angel took young Joseph Smith to a stone vault in western New York State where he retrieved two golden plates which had written upon them what we would know, come to know today as the Book of Mormon. Here is an angel who brought a truth that was contrary to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Many Mormons today will tell you that, no, we're Christians but their gospel is no good news at all. It is not a capital G gospel. It is a small G gospel. It lacks any good news, to be honest. Because Mormonism speaks of different ways, different heavens that you can attain to. And how do you get to these different levels? You get to these levels by the different works that you do. It's Christ and. And this Christ that they speak of is not the Christ that you and I know. The Christ that they speak of is one who was created by God, not one who was equal with God and God himself, who has existed for all eternity, but a created God. And not just a created God, but the brother, the spiritual brother of Satan himself. This is what the Mormon church teaches, and they claim that this was revealed, says Joseph Smith, by an angel. And of such people, Paul says, may they be under God's curse. Of course, the Mar Mormons are not the only ones who have distorted the gospel. And it's easy to point to them, but the truth is that there are many who have distorted the gospel. Jesus was not created. Jesus did not become God. You know, that's one of the things the Mormon church says. It says that you and I, we can become gods. And they say that that's what happened to Jesus. He was born of God. And then he became God when he had his own planet of his own. 
a promise that's held out to those who have gone through specific temple rituals in the Mormon church and have uh, performed certain acts to uh, get there. But their job then, of course, is to be gods of their own planets, which now they procreate and fill. It is not the gospel of the Bible. Here in Galatians, there was no denying who Jesus was. The, the Mormons deny who Jesus is. But the Galatians, they knew who Jesus was. They weren't denying who Jesus was, but they were saying that Jesus wasn't enough. Have you experienced others who have said Jesus wasn't enough? Last week we talked about, we finished a series, Stuff Christians Do. And again, it's important to understand that we do these things out of a response, not out of a requirement for salvation. We are never justified by our works. Our lives are lived in response to our salvation, not to earn our salvation. And anyone who teaches you is under God's curse. And now in verse 10, Paul raises one more concern. He says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Here's kind of the impression I get when I read this passage, is what had happened to these Galatian believers is that they were seeking, striving after the approval of others. And so they began to do what these agitators asked so that they could receive their approval. And how often it is that people seek approval. And here Paul is saying, am I trying to win the approval of human beings? And he says, no. Am I trying to please people? No. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. It's easy to fall into the trap of trying to please people. And it doesn't specifically call it out here, but I wonder if these Galatians, asserts, if these People had it deserted just to gain that approval. Maybe they were family members, friends. I'm sure they knew them. And so how easy it is sometimes to desert, to desert the gospel to gain the approval of others. Young adults, teenagers especially, how we long to receive the approval of others, how do we we believe that the world is looking at us and, and, and we're trying to prove ourselves to them. And so we'll hide that badge that says I'm a Christian so that we can get the approval of others. And we create these formulas of how to be accepted. If you, if you do this, if you don't drink, if you don't smoke, you don't chew, you don't go with girls who do, we'll accept you. And in that we have this sense of control, don't we? And I think that comes back to our striving nature, that we want to do it. Me, do it, God. I'll do it. I don't need Jesus to do it. I'll do it myself. That's our human nature and our pride talking. Jesus says he did it. God is not manipulated. You can't say, God, if I do this, A, B, and C, then you got to give me D. God is not manipulated. God has given us his son that all believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. There is nothing more that needs to be done to receive God's favor. There is no, he gave us his son, and if you do this, then you'll be saved. It's, no, God sent his one and only son that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. There is no Jesus and. It's just Jesus. As I was preparing for this week's message, I was reminded how my my striving even played into my own salvation. I remember when I was at the University of Nebraska, a young student, and, and I was walking down the road. I was like, what is my meaning? What is my purpose in life? And, and I was striving for purpose. And in a very real sense, God used that striving for purpose to draw me to himself. See, I was pursuing that purpose in things that would give me affluence, you know, make me rich. You know, I wanted to be an airline pilot first. That was kind of cool. Except there was that whole electrical engineering and math and calculus and all that kind of got in the way. So then I thought I would try something different, maybe uh, be a, a pre-law major or a pre-med major. I was longing for some sense of purpose in my life. 
And when I received Christ, a few years later, while I was in the Air Force, God called me into ministry, and I had a clear purpose. But my purpose, my striving for purpose, should never replace my striving for Jesus. Sometimes God uses our striving to draw him to himself. But we should never substitute our striving for purpose, for identity, for legacy, to become a substitute for God. You know, since I found Jesus, yes, God has given me purpose in my life. I love that I get up every day and I know that God has a plan and a purpose for me. But Jesus didn't die on the cross to satisfy my striving. Jesus died on the cross that he might have a relationship. He died that I might seek him. And there are blessings that we receive because of that. I have purpose, I have hope, I have joy and peace and patience and all those things, but those things never replace Jesus. We must not let our striving for anything else lead us to desert the gospel of Jesus Christ. Striving for relationship, for acceptance, for purpose. None of those things should... Take our eyes off Jesus. Jesus should always be the center of our attention. In 1924, George Mallory returned to Mount Everest. It was his third and would be his final attempt. He was last seen on the way to the summit with his partner, Andrew Irving. 75 years later, in 1999, his body was found on the mountain's north ridge. He tried to climb the mountain because it was there. I get that adrenaline rush thing. I enjoy some adrenaline things. I wouldn't say I'm an adrenaline junkie. I get that. But sometimes when we strive to do something just because it's there, whether it's striving for approval or purpose or relationship, it can lead us away from the gospel and it can lead us away from the path of life. The Galatians, they deserted the gospel and those agitators were accursed. This alternative, this small g gospel of which these agitators were preaching was not good news. This small g gospel that said Jesus and would lead to their death. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. Stop striving for God's acceptance. God sent his son that all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. God, when you receive Jesus Christ, accepts you. Accept the gift of God's acceptance. We accept God by faith. And we enter into this relationship simply for the sake of this relationship with the Son of God and the Lord himself. Have you come to the place in your spiritual life that if you were to die today, you know for certain you go to heaven? And if God were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? May your answer be this, because I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. It's nothing more. It's nothing more than that. It's not because I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and I was baptized. It's not I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and I gave up smoking. It's not I received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and I was confirmed. Thinking right now in this moment back to the young Christian I was when I was first baptized. And they asked me that question. They said, if, you, if God were to say, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? And I said, well, I've received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I've lived a pretty good life. How naive I was. Jesus and is no gospel at all. Jesus alone paid the penalty for your sins, and in him we find eternal life. Let me encourage you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray for your forgiveness for those times that we have added an and to the gospel. 
Maybe it's been for our own selves, to our own religious experience that we've added this and. Believing that if we added this and, then, well, you maybe wouldn't love us less for the things that we've done, but you might love us a little bit more for these and things that we've added. We pray for your forgiveness. Maybe there are those here today that believe that they've been saved because they're good works, by the good things that they've done, because they're not that bad, because they're better than that person. None of those things get a person to, to, to heaven. The only thing that saves us from the power of this work, wicked world is a relationship with Jesus, having received his forgiveness, his justification by faith. And boy, we're going to drill home on that the rest of this series, and we will be reminded again and again that it is by faith, through grace that we are saved. It is by grace through faith that we are saved. Lord, thank you that we do nothing to earn your favor, but, but by Christ's death on the cross, we are seen just as if we had never sinned at all. We are justified and accepted by you, God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Each one of us. Father, we come to you now and, and we uh, bring an, an offering of, of money and of tithes and, and maybe our time and, and other efforts, but Lord, we know it's uh, because of the gift that you've given to us first. So, Father, we ask that you would bless our offering, that you would uh, use it mightily for your kingdom, and that you would uh, guide us in uh, continuing to lift up your name and your son, and it's in your spirit that we pray this. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Pastor. And as he's led us or given us an introduction, let's all stand and sing it as well with my soul this morning. <clears throat> When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed soul. Uh, the message that the pastor has given to us this morning gives us uh, uh, opportunity, gives us the uh, call to make sure we share that with others. And so I'll, say, I'll call out Journey Together and you shout back, share the hope, and let's all go do that today. Journey Together, share the hope. Thank you. Maybe just one. 